Um, okay, thank you for being here. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity with the Drawing Discourse uh, exhibition that our students are able to divide into groups and choose an artist from the exhibition in which they host during studio visits. And um, these will be up on the Drawing Discourse website for everyone to view um, for years to come. And so this group chose you, Sarah. And so I am gonna turn it over to them so they can introduce you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian and I am a BA student here at UNC Asheville. Sarah Leahy is a New York-based artist who focuses on creating work that has a sensory, tactile presence with a luminous depth and uses plexiglass with a, in a variety of formats to establish a spatial and psychological connection with the viewer. Ms. Mm -hmm. Leahy has presented eight solo exhibitions at the Kim Foster Gallery in New York between 1998 to 2015, as well as over 30 selected group exhibitions, both all across the country and overseas, including South Korea, Italy, and the UK. Ms. Leahy has, was the recipient of a grant from the New York State Foundation for the Arts in 2001 and is an ongoing studio recipient from the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts starting in 1999. Ms. Leahy received a Norfolk Wet Fellowship from Yale University and a BA from Bennington College in 1977. Her work is in private collections in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, Seattle, Dallas, Pittsburgh, Canada, and the United Kingdom. And we are so pleased to have Sarah Leahy with us this afternoon. I will now turn over the screen to her. Thank you, everybody. Nice to meet you all. And thanks for selecting me. I really am flattered. Um, and I will, as I said before, I'm not really used to doing this. Um, and I'm pretty shy and quiet. Just, I've had uh, many studio visits and discussions hosted them in my studio um, with students of oh, lots of different ages. We've had open studios, art professionals. I even started a program with the UN ambassadors here, um, which is interesting. But I've never given a talk about myself quite it's extensive. So I'm, I'm pretty shy and quiet as I already mentioned. So I thought I'd write a script for myself. Um, so please forgive me if I'm reading at times, it's just so that it can be clear. Um, but having said that, I would also like to please ask you to please interrupt me anytime if you have a question about anything I'm, I'm saying. Let's not, you know, go through the whole thing and then try to go back. Let's discuss each step of the way. I would, I find that easier. So, um, as already mentioned, I was in the Elizabeth Foundation. I am in the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts, and this studio that you're looking at, me standing there in front of this piece, is about 320 square feet. Um, the program is wonderful. It gives artists studio space, support, and uh, community, which I all of which are extremely important in the actual world. It's um, the distinction about this building, though, is that every um, two years you have to re up as a member, and um, that is entirely dependent on the quality of your work and your professionalism and how much you use the space. Most importantly, the quality of your work, and they do kick people out. So you know, it just got renewed. Thank God. <laughs> Anyway, they have two uh, studio spaces and a printmaking workshop. Um, it's a great place. And as I mentioned before, you know, community, having a community when you finish school, grad school, whatever, is really, really helpful to supporting your practice in the real world. It just, it, it just is. So something's beeping in my house, sorry. Um, I hope you don't can't hear that. Oh. So I'm gonna talk about my work and my career and uh, ideas and techniques. Obviously all those things go hand in hand as you develop them. Um, a little history, as you just mentioned, uh, I went to Bennington. I studied with um, Pat Adams, who was really my mentor there, uh, Sidney Tillam and Stanley Rosen. Um, did not go to grad school, which I regret, but too late now. Anyway, <laughs> good for you all. Um, I, I moved to New York after college, um, trying to figure out how to paint, what to do. And I accidentally, or by chance, got a job as a textile designer. I had no idea what that was. Um, no, you know, it was basically on the strength of my portfolio. They said, oh, you can draw. So they hired me for a nominal amount of money and I learned on the job. Um, so uh, I spent, well, let's just look, I had, this is my studio, as I mentioned, and a little bit more of a tour. Let me move this down, there. 
This is, that's without me in front of it. Um, this is just going around the space in the back is my drafting table and then my, my new other table. I don't have a computer in my studio and this is a, the uh, other wall. So um, it's sort of by chance and by accident that I don't because I find that sitting in front of your computer just kind of sucks you in and I go there to work um, and think and you know, anyway, here I am at home on my computer. Uh, just quickly, these are the textile designs I was talking about, but you, these are the last two are mine. Anyway, so this is my work table. Um, uh, this is it really, I use India ink and this, can, can you see my little, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. This old Skippy jar, which is covered with ink is the black India ink mixed with water. This is more water. And this is what I pour it into. I work with paper towels, sandpaper, and the ink. That's it. Those are all my materials right there in a nutshell. Um, so people often ask me, that's often the first question actually, um, what is it? <laughs> Why do you use this material? Um, especially when I'm exhibiting, they walk in and kind of walk in and walk up and then walk really close and look you know, like, well, for that reason. What, what am I looking at? So I um, find myself trying to discuss that a lot. These are the inks. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit backwards. There, this is the plexiglass that I use. It's quarter inch clear plexi. You can see it's completely clear. It's reflecting the light on the ceiling. Um, I, you know, when I finished college, I was, you know, Bennington, we had a lot of people that did color field painting and painting on, certainly painting on canvas was what you did. And I just never liked it. I don't know why I was always trying to get some light and air into the work. I can't explain it any way I liked doing watercolors, but I was looking for other materials. And I, um, I live in lower Manhattan. I've lived down here for 40 years. It's changed a bit, shall we say, but below Canal Street, I don't know if any of you know Canal Street and bisects Manhattan east west and in the in back in the day this is treasure trove of like plastic stores and rubber stores and metal stores and wonderful art um store called um, pearl paint lots of heart you know just had materials so i found plexi and just thought oh my god this is so cool i really this is how do i work with this i want this is it i can i can do something with this so as i mentioned i was a textile designer and we used to use um this stuff this india ink this very very intense concentrated um, beautiful, pure pigment without medium, however, which is great because you'd have to paint designs and then you'd sell the, sell the print to, you know, who's ever buying it and you'd basically throw the painting away. So it didn't matter. But if for my purposes, these are terribly unstable. Basically the reds and the yellows just disappear <laughs> after about a year of invisible ink. So I realized that wasn't going to work. Um, and eventually switched to painting in black and white. And for some reason, everything clicked when I did that. The, the imagery, the way to work, everything started to work. This is, this is, my, this is my material. That bottle will probably make uh, 20 paintings actually, um, which is funny. So um, <clears throat> I started to work more directly on the surface. I tried to do a lot of different things. I know plenty of people have tried to work with Plexi or do work with Plexi. Um, and I haven't really seen anyone that does what I do. Mostly I've seen people sort of paint on the surface or use photo emulsion techniques or molding or something like that. Um, I really am painting to embed the image in the surface. Uh, so back to the plexi. So that is how it starts. Then I sand it. And this is um, using many, many, <laughs> Well, I start with a, a heavier, you know, harder sandpaper and eventually end up with something like 880 or 1000 uh, grit, which is really fine. So this is, this is maybe four passes of sanding the entire surface. Um, it's a very, you, you could, if you even feel the surface, you can barely feel that there's any, you know, grit uh, or tooth to it, but it is enough to hold the ink in the grooves in a way. So once you paint, once I painted this, you can wash it. I mean, it doesn't come off. It's not, you know, it's not like charcoal on paper, which is so vulnerable, really. Um, so back to that, let's see. 
Now this is, you can also see this still remains very translucent, even though I've sanded it and there's some amount of ink on it. That same piece put up against the wall becomes that much more saturated. So everything needs something behind it so that it's its full force, so to speak. Does that make any sense so far? Okay. <laughs> so um, once I figured out that, I sort of realized that I didn't want to use brushes. I was trying to find a way to make an image without um, any drips or you know anything distracting from the image, brush mark, hand, any evidence of my hand really. Um, this technique also is was so great because I could work back into it. The materials aren't hazardous. Um, it's a hard, it sort of solved all the things I was looking for. It's fantastic. Um, so I began, uh, well, I should probably describe the technique a bit more um, and please interrupt me for anything. Let me see what I'm doing. Ah, okay, this is a surface. Um, so as I mentioned, I sand it a number of times until the whole surface is completely um, abraded, but you know, really, really fine. Then I screw it onto the wall, which you guys have seen how the piece is attached to the wall. Um, and then I begin by washing it with water. So it's like a <laughs> litter, my studio floor is a mess. Water full of water on and that, that container of ink mixed with uh, water, I apply a very light wash tone. And then I basically, if you look at me doing this, it looks like I'm rubbing it off, which I almost am, but I'm rubbing it down so that there isn't any streakiness or drips running down or anything like that. The point being is that I'm building up this tone, again, without an evidence of my hand, I'm just building up this tone. So back to, what was that? This is like, gosh, 10, 15 layers of that tone. I mean, if you see me doing one to the next, to the next, to the next, you probably wouldn't even notice a difference all that much. Um, but I find that you can feel the density of it, you know? Um, and I think that's really, really important. Um, so literally, sorry, I'll go back to this. The darker areas down here where it's really almost black is that same tone, just more of it. So you feel this, this the, you know, the, this velvety dense, you know, I've, I've tried just applying black ink if I was doing really graphic, you know, super black and white image with no gray, but it, you can feel it. It's like you've slapped it onto the surface. So this, this gives this luminosity, the white is luminous. This, this you know, the, the thing about plexi is it holds the light in the pane of glass, especially if it's lit correctly. Um, if you don't light it correctly, it kind of bounces right off, but it can have this really, uh, evocative depth to it, which I like. That's what I'm going for. So anyway, I build up the tone. This this painting in particular, let's see, I'd probably get to about here. And then I would start adding more ink here and obviously keep on going to make the blacker areas and the whiter areas I'm sanding out. And as I go on and on with this back and forth and back and forth, it slowly kind of refines and comes into focus. Now, obviously this takes a long time. <laughs> um, but there's, you know, I, I think that the, the sort of compression of time that you feel when you're looking at it and all that attention, it, you can feel it in the work, I, I hope. That's, that's the point of all this. I'm not trying to make work for myself. Um, are there any questions? Do you guys understand what I'm talking about? Hmm. Um, ask a question. Please. What is your ink to water ratio? Oh, good question. Um, gosh. <laughs> I never even thought about it. I just sort of do it without thinking. Um, gotcha. Probably 50 50 or maybe um, 60 40 water to ink. Gotcha. It's pretty light. Um, and of course, I adjust that, you know, depending on the work too. Like, you know, if I need something a little bit darker, I'll add more ink in. But <clears throat> I, I basically, you know, I saturate paper towel with it and squeeze it out. Well, it depends on the, the, the what I'm really working on. It, it's an interesting process too because it starts out being very big and you know large movements and gestures and then it becomes more and more and more refined both with my hand and the paper towel which you can scrunch up to make very small so this huge so to speak brush of it um, same thing with the sandpaper I mean if I need something really super um, sharp or fine I'm bending it in, 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 into a crease to make this tiny little thing I can to use to basically quote unquote erase the ink that I've applied. Um, yeah. 
so it sounds crazy. I don't know. It works for me. I, I still do use brushes when I'm doing um, watercolors on, on paper, but that's a different story. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? I, I wanted to demonstrate this, but I, again, I'm sorry. I couldn't be in my studio to do that. I couldn't figure out a way to take a video. So anyway. Okay. I'll ask mine. Um, so you mentioned how like refracted light and like layering is really important. And we've also talked about um, your like specifications for displaying your piece, like here mm -hmm. in the um, Do you have like any practical, like professional practice advice for students who are wanting to hang their art in the future? And like, do you have any like, specific um, communications when you are having a piece displayed? So your question is about how to hang art to its best. Yes. Advantage. Okay, sorry, I couldn't how quite hear it. it. If you have any advice for us. Well, I, you know, I, this was trial and error when I started hanging these, and um, I was in a gallery for a long time, and we discovered that it's real. The answer, sorry, is to say trial and error. You have to be there and figure it out on the on the scene because every situation is different. That's my experience, and um, I obviously didn't control when I sent the piece over to the UK, I, I wasn't able to go. So I, I hope they hung it right. I don't know. But um, for myself, the work, if you, if you, uh, this particular work, if you, if you put a spotlight directly on it, it basically bounces off and you can't even see it sort of. But if you crisscross it, so the light goes in on the sides of the plexi, it comes to life. It like, it takes the light in and it becomes this really, um, you know, super set, very, it, it comes to life. It's great. So that worked for me. I don't know. It depends on the work itself. It depends on if it has glass in front of it, if it's a drawing, you know, all these conditions, of course. So you really just have to fool around, see what works best, stand in front of it and have someone do the lighting for you, of course, um, if you can. And mm -hmm. that, that's my best answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's no, sorry, go ahead. I thought someone said something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're good. But I do have a question about um, your images. Do you do like an uh, like a sketch, like either with pencil or do you have an image behind it that you work off of as you're sanding? Um, no, and I was gonna get to that, but I'll go right to it. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> it's okay. All these images are from my own photos. And let me see, here's another one. This is another real close up of back in the beginning, this piece. So it's really funny. This is a really from, I mean, just as an aside, my photos are nothing special, but um, the work starts out with this sense of what I wanna see, if that makes any sense, a sense of its physicality, where it's going, I mean, from where it's generated in me. And then I kind of search for an image that I've already taken, or I go out and take a lot of photographs to find something that I can use as a reference. Um, tell me if that makes sense or stop me if not. Of it. Anyway, so I have this thing. This particular one is from some crummy little three by five photo I took a long time ago. Someone pointed out to me at one of the open studios that, oh, this was really like in the eighties because look at the big shoulder pads on there. And I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> this was from the garment center. And in fact, this is a day where they used to the, this thing in Manhattan, this, sorry, this is just sidebar, but um, thing in Manhattan called um, Manhattan Henge. Two days out of the year, right before the time changes, the sun lines up east-west. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So it's very cool. <laughs> they get this wonderful like light going east-west and the silhouettes and the shadows. It's, it's really cool. It has to be a sunny day, of course, but anyway, that's what it's from. So um, I realized that was at work. That's what I was looking for on this. Um, Anyway, I to take that little three by five thing and get it up there. I used to have a slide projector that would, you know, shine it up. Um, I now a friend of mine is it in this picture. Yeah, right here. He gave me one of these old projectors. You can put a translucent transparency on top and then then um, project it onto the image. That works. That's great. You know, it helps to start because you're making this often really large thing and only can get arm's length from it, obviously, because you're working on it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it only works in the beginning because you're sort of locating the image where you want it. And then once you start painting it, you can't really see this projection anyway. It just gets you going into it. And I would say that, um, possibly, uh, 
a benefit, or I don't know how, I haven't really thought about it that way, of the fact that the work takes so long to make is that it becomes, you kind of know it inside out and you know what you need to do um, where, you know, you just come in and go, oh, I, I got to do that over here. Or, and then you try to figure out, did it work? Um, and in this piece, this is a five panel, I'll show it to you later. Uh, it's 20 feet long and seven feet high. Um, and it spanned before COVID and after COVID and from one studio to another. I couldn't even put them together in the other studio because it was smaller. Um, then I put it together and had to work on it to get it all to just sort of read in the way I wanted it to. Anyway, I hope I answered your question. I begin with the sense of it. Then I go to try to find a photo for a reference. Then I project it. Then I, that's really just the beginning of the painting. And then it, it evolves from there. Something I'm trying to see. <laughs> that made sense. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is some of my early work. This is very large again. And um, this kind of goes to what I was just saying, which is you start out painting and then you are, you know, an arm's length from this and you just have to feel it kind of, you know what you're doing. Um, sorry, it's going to take, that's another image of water. Um, These are, of course, on my website. It's an image of nighttime. <laughs> okay. So I did um, a lot of work, this is midway, um, doing images of land and seascapes and light and this physical sense of them and standing in front of that. They're very big. Um, and I kind of got to the point where it was rather finished and I was struggling to kind of figure out what was next. Um, see if I can. And I began by painting interiors, portraits. And again, here's that image, sort of another version of it. Come on, thing. There we go. Manhattan Henge. <laughs> and then I was working on interiors. This is a diptych, actually. This is one half. Here's the middle. Uh, it's very large. It's actually the hall. Actually, Edgar's studio is right next door. Uh, <laughs> This is huge. Um, I was obsessed with this for a while. It's an image of the uh, <clears throat> workings of the Wonder Wheel down in Coney Island, but um, I've done many versions of it. So there's a lot of uh, sort of connecting. Let me close some of these things here. Ah, oh, wait a minute. Okay. I do have a question if you don't mind. Please, please. Go um, ahead. Seems pretty obvious that you do gravitate towards larger scale pieces. Um, can you just talk about like what that adds to your work or like why it is um, that you work at such a large scale? And maybe if you do have smaller pieces, talk about that as well. I do have some, but not many. The, the ones I just showed you of the water moving like that are 31 by 40 inches, which is not that small, but um, because they're close ups, I think they probably feel bigger than they actually are a little bit. I, I gravitate them because I toward that toward doing larger stuff because I want you to feel the physical sense of it. You know, in other words, it's almost one to one. Um, or as I said, those close ups of water to draw you in more. I don't I don't know. It's a good question, and um, I don't want there to be any distance. I really have always wanted it. First of all, to be an image that's just there that draws you in physically, and compels you to kind of come close and feel it. Um, I think that brings out its kind of emotional undercurrent a little bit more. Um, that's the best answer I can give. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. 
Now I've lost that thing. <clears throat> What was interesting, let me see here, constructs, reset. What was interesting is, I'm shifting around. I was, I was with a gallery. If you'd like me to talk about exhibiting and how that worked, um, I was going to do that here for quite a while. I um, got the gallery by back in the day, <clears throat> excuse me, sending out slide packages endlessly, screwing up my courage. And well, first of all, I made everybody in, in back, you guys are too young, but back in the day, you'd go into any gallery and you see piles of manila envelopes behind the, the desk that, you know, somebody was going to have to look at at some point and make some choices and mostly probably not want to see any of it. But I decided, well, I'm going to send a package, but I'm going to send it out, send them out in plastic pack. You know, I can make a distinguishing package so that you could go into the gallery and say, oh, I'm Sarah Leahy. You know, have you looked at that package over there? That's my work. So that maybe if they had or if they would, they would remember me and kind of put two in, you know, anyway, the best I could manage. Like I said, I'm shy and quiet. This was not easy for me to do. Um, but it worked. Eventually, I had quite a lot of studio visits with gallerists and it was included in solo show and um, actually sold a lot of the work in the show and then got picked up by that gallery, which is Kim Foster Gallery. Um, and Kim was doing great. We had a very good run as partners. She, um, and that's what it is, by the way, in a gallery is you are a partner <laughs> and it's not a mommy daddy situation. You are a partner in that gallery. You bring it to it and they bring to you. And um, that's the best, in my experience, I, I think that's the best situation as it should be um, because it gives you, I mean, you're much, as much input and control as the gallerist. And um, I don't know. Anyway, we moved to Chelsea in 2000. I had eight shows with her and eventually I left in 2015 when things went awry, kind of, that's another story. Um, and now I am seeking representation again. But during, when I stopped having the routine of, um, it's not a routine really, but the, yeah, all right, routine. Um, of developing a, a body of work, eight to 10 paintings to show every two years. It was in a way very liberating because I just started going and doing anything like, and this is one of the things I did, which I ended up calling constructions. Um, I did a lot of work like this. And to me, this was here, I'll show you another one. Uh, really a lot like the other work, which is that I'm trying to paint light, very specific, like I called this noon shadows time of day, whether a particular surface of something. Um, this one is, these were also layered. Um, that first one that was so dark had 72 different pieces. This is five, they're layered over each other. So you get this sense of light and density. It's, it's sculptural, really, it's like a relief. Um, this is maybe an inch off the wall, possibly. So wait, here's another one. Yeah, this one I called charcoal. <laughs> Um, this one, this one I exhibited actually, um, it's five by seven feet. Each of these is a 12 inch square and they're attached with little tiny uh, nails to the wall. And this one is huge. This is 20 by nine feet. I feel like this is an interior space and the, I'm just trying to render the light just with no figures, no, no, quote, drawing, but just the light and um, create a sense of space, like walking into a room. So that's what I was doing with these. They're on my website, they're under constructions. And my gosh, I have many more than that are actually on the website. <laughs> um, so I did a lot of different things. I, that was great. You know, it was very, um, I think it can be wonderful to have that sense of freedom. I also think it can be very wonderful to have a sense of boredom and stuckness because when you walk, literally walk around, I walk a lot in New York, walk or, you know, metaphorically walk around trying to say, what do I do? I'm not sure, I'm stuck, I don't know where I am. That can be a, a, an opportunity to kind of let stuff bubble up that you normally wouldn't pay any attention to. You're kind of like on the clock and you're doing your thing and you gotta finish that and do this, do that and the other thing. It's very interesting if you pay attention to it. So that's what I would say. Um, I, uh, let's see what's next. 
Oh, I have to go back. Somehow I have to get back to them. <laughs> I'm gonna do this now. Okay. Yeah, I missed a whole chunk. Uh, sorry, you guys. Um, new share. Okay, let's see if I can get to it again. Oh, wait a minute. So while you're looking, I'm gonna ask about this one that's on the screen right now, which is absolutely beautiful. And oh, um, thanks. Uh, you know, viewing your work in person, you're right. The it's almost like the panel um, instead of reflecting back to you, it absorbs the light in just a really lovely, lovely way. So, so you know, while some of these marks are very broad, there's some highly detailed areas. And so, can I just um, yeah ask again, you can work additive, additively, but also subtractive? Yes. Well? Okay. Yeah, let me talk about this one. So I would have, um, you have to sometimes strategize how you're going to make something, obviously. Um, this one, I would have really just worked on the dark black areas, built it up very slowly, and then with a very fine sandpaper done. Can you see my little cursor yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah. Um, sanded out this, you know, this area, it would have been very black and white and made these marks. This would have taken a long time. I actually had to fix one of these recently. It's like, oh God. <laughs> um, that way, when I had finished this whole left section with all of this marking, this is all sanding. Sanding and then painting and the fine, you know, bent piece of sandpaper to scrape very slightly and a very fine point on a piece of paper towel. And I could have used a brush, but I was used to paper towels to make all this. And it's hard, you know, you have to, you don't want it to be a hard edge. It wants to be a softer edge. So sanding the edges of everything. And, and um, it's tricky, you know, you have to, I had one of my teachers at Bennington was always saying, you have to find your own technique, your own, you're going to have to invent things to make what you want to make. And I was, you know, you don't realize that's to be true until you do do that. Um, she's right. Uh, so the way I sanded and how I apply the, 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 the little bit of water, a little bit of ink, and then um, wiping it slightly just to make that softness on the edge there, it, it just takes practice. Um, I don't know if any of you guys watercolor, but I always find if I haven't made a watercolor in a while because it's very hard to work back in. I mean, there are some tricks and stuff, but it mostly they're tricks. <laughs> um, to do a, a successful watercolor, you, you, you have, I have to practice. I mean, I have to do, I have to screw it up like five times before like, oh, I got it, you know, um, until you get kind of in a groove. So this is true here, even though I am able to work back in. Um, one of the things I like about my technique is and I find it to be evident in the work is that from the very beginning sanding to the very end, everything I do is evident. There's no hiding. I can't, I can't um, cover up a mistake, so to speak. I have to, I have to just pay attention really well all the time, which is what I want to do. So um, even I don't, I would love to be able to use a mechanical sander, but it gives a mechanical sand in the, on the plexi which therefore picks up the ink and makes that effect. So it's hard work, but um, it, there is, you know, it yields something. So I would have, I'm, I don't know if I'm answering your question, Tammy, but I would have made, created this black, black, black and white silhouette and then gone over to this, this is just, this one is so sort of cut and dried, um, very much and very slowly brought up this soft, uh, ripple in the water secondarily. Because if I had done that simultaneously and I wanted to go back in here, for instance, I would have to sand out. It would be very difficult not to mess up this very light faded tongue right there. Does that make sense? 
Absolutely. And when you're building your layers of value, it sounds like the dark doesn't land as a dark. It starts light and then you build it to be the dark. Do you exactly. have to stand in between to keep allowing the the tooth no. to accept more or it, it's stable? No, that's a great question. No, it's stable. It's stable. Okay. Um, actually, one of the things about really dark, dark is sometimes you see uh, you can see the layer of the ink after a while because it gets so built up. So you have to, oh, that's, that's, I'm getting into the weeds now, but um, you have to wash it with water and spread it out to make sure that you're not getting a sort of a gloss or something like that. I don't, I don't like that. As I said, I just want the image to be there. So um, hold on, let me try this now. I have another idea because I have this all in a file. Desktop, yes, share. Okay. Um, that's not working. Okay. Sorry. I wish I could do this better. You're fine. <laughs> um, do you see that? Yep. Okay. That's another image. Hmm. Uh, okay. That's funny. Huh. I didn't click on that. Okay. Let's try another. Um, okay. So, this is the work that I am, Let's see if I can get doing now. Hmm. Okay. There. Okay. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. This is the work that I'm currently doing. So it evolved the work that I had been, the imagery evolved from doing the early like land and seascapes to moving away from that after I'd really done it to the hilt. I thought I, I missed a whole chunk to show you. I apologize. Um, maybe I can find it. Hold on. Hmm. Maybe it's just too much. There, that's one of the other light coming through leaves. Um, yeah, okay, this is kind of working. There. This is enormous. Um, are you seeing this image? Of yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So these are like kind of walls. I mean, they filled the back of my wall in my studio. I couldn't have made them any bigger if I wanted to. Um, so again, to answer your earlier question, this um, one of you guys was asking the size. I really wanted you to feel like it, you know, had a one to like you could, could walk into it almost. Um, it's huge, this piece. I think it's eight by 78 by 53, something like that. Um, <clears throat> uh, do you have um, like plexiglass come in that size, or do you have a way of like, you um, know, doing panels <laughs> together? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, like I said, no, I have to have it cut. I mean, you can cut it yourself. Um, the material isn't, I, I don't want to cut it myself. I, you have to have a giant table saw. And also there's a, something about that heating it up to a certain um, degree that makes it create something that it emits, which is not healthy to read. Mm -hmm. So um, I have to, it's tricky because especially when I was exhibiting a lot, I'd have to kind of try to figure out the size of things, even though that would change what I wanted to work. You know, it's like trying to do everything at once without knowing what you're doing. Um, I would have to get it cut and delivered to answer yeah. your question. So this is 47 by 33 inches, I think. Um, this is kind of working actually. But there has to be some limitations to the scale that you can go with the Plexi. And is that one of the reasons why some of them are multi-panels? Yeah, good question. This is um, 40, 30, I worked a lot on this size, 31 by 40. Let me go back to that then. Um, Uh, 
Okay. Yes and no. I mean, yes, there is. Um, you can get plexi from six to six by eight feet. So, um, and you can get it four by 10, but they don't always have that, blah, blah, blah. Of course, you can get anything you want if you want to pay for it, but that's <laughs> not going to happen. Um, so, I, you know, I, this is not because of that. I mean, I had to make this in different panels because it is, as I said, 20 feet long and each piece is seven feet high. So, um, no, I realized at a certain point that I was making multi-part work and that I was putting them together. They're not narrative. This is meant to be something uh, about the arc of light through the day in the sense of seeing these individual moments that I find this is really what the work is about for me. Um, very beautiful, very much pausing you. Um, so you just stand there and, and notice it. Um, I think that I think it works. I came across this phrase, poetic compression, which I love. Um, it to me means it's almost like when you read a poem and you read, you know, it's not linear. It's not a narrative, but you put all of it together and it reveals this feeling. And that is what the intention is here. So um, I, I can't take credit for that phrase, but it's very cool. <laughs> I like it. Uh, <clears throat> You know, as I said, it begins with a sense of physicality and this presence I want, um, bringing the image and making it in this space with this kind of volume and the texture, the presence. I want the, the surface and the sense of it to be so compelling. You want to go and look at it. You want to go and stand in front of it. And it's that simple. I mean, it's really just that simple. Um, Yeah, I feel like the method of working that I have and the time I spend um, may hopefully induce you to spend time and perceptively look and be quiet. That's it, I mean, really. So let me show you some more pieces. Um, this is one I've just finished, I think. <laughs> this is more of a sense of, well, the title is weightless, but this dislocation, I almost think of it as a companion to the other one, which is very much about the day and how it's, ooh, I can put multiple pieces up. This is getting confusing for you guys. Um, <laughs> this has a different feeling. It's really uh, the sense of being unmoored. That's the best I can say. These, this is also seven feet tall. Um, here's a piece that's showing in your gallery right now. I should close these, let's see. This is three parts. These are all the same size as what's in the gallery right now. So of course, this is the morning and this is midday and then evening, it feels like it's just a passage through, but very distinct. I, this I think might be what started me on this. This is a piece that I took a long time working on. These are all individual. Can you, can you see this everyone? Just tell me. Yeah. Okay. These are all um, <clears throat> 12 by 12 inch individual um, plexiglass pieces. I've obviously photoshopped this, even, but on the wall they're, they're uh, attached by sitting on little nails. Um, and they're three inches apart. I started with this one here. It really started, and I'll admit, I was starting to paint this larger image with this close up. And I thought, you know, I'm really just interested in that. Why don't I just paint that? And then I began to realize I wanted to put things together, these two men's necks on the train, subway in the morning, on the commuting. And it just slowly evolved. Um, I, I feel like you kind of look around, you don't read it like a comic book or a narrative. I think you look from one around and about and this whole thing again works up together to create an overall tone. Um, this took a while. It's funny, small paintings take almost as long as big ones, <laughs> depending on the image, but. Um, so that's. In fact, that piece we've had in John Discourse before that's right. That's and that right. was going to be know, one of my right. questions if you had ever applied before. And somehow I didn't 
put it together, the names and yes. Um, I forgot that. I uh, applied. Yeah, this is pre-COVID, so like long ago and far away, right? <laughs> but, yes, and it was actually when our building was under renovation. So we were using right. um, the campus of Warren Wilson graciously uh, loaned us their mm -hmm. gallery space. And I might have blocked it because I think I had PTSD from hanging this one. If I I'm sorry. Thing with all those little nails. <laughs> it, it was right, pain to hang. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, and imagery wise, these people are, I mean, it's, I, half of them are family and friends, and half are people I see on the train or um, standing in the subway platform, and that guy has a story behind that, but um, I don't think there's any particular significance to like, if I know them or not, if they just were, the, I mean, of course it is to me, but not to you. Um, it just was this, the, the, the pose, the position, the sense of it, the feeling of it, you know, and how it read with the images next to it and around it that I, I chose them, so. Um, Something else I wanted to say is that I, it's one of the, actually it's one of the questions I get sometimes, or comments rather. Um, these, as I said, if I could pull up the beginning again, or sorry, if I can find it. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. I'm not sure it's in this. No, it's not. Okay, never mind. Um, yeah, it's a pain to hang. I'm sorry, Tammy. <laughs> um, anyway, there's a very not a problem. I was just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> well, even in this one, you can see. No, it's hard for me. Um, and in these tall seven foot ones, I need to have a screw in the middle because mm. it's so tall it would sort of bubble out kind of. Mm. Uh, so sometimes people find this like they get very annoyed with it because I think I finally figured out a long time ago that. I think it's because, it, you know, why, how can you put something through a painting? That's not okay. Um, I, you know, back to the, this. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? I mean, there's not a lot of, that's, I'm being facetious. There's not a lot of ways you can attach a translucent or almost transparent thing to a wall. Um, you can either go through it or you can clip it on the sides. And I don't want to do that. I, um, first of all, that would prevent the light from coming in on the side and being held in the plexi. And I think it's really nice to see. I find the materials so um, specific. You know, this is extruded acrylic. These are, ink is made of soot and water. I mean, this is just steel. And I think that the the materiality of the steel screws just makes you goes just brings out the contrast of this atmospheric image. I like it. It bothers some people. You know, I have to listen to that, and I get I get it. But um, I I like it. I prefer it. I've chosen. I also really like the simplicity of it. I mean, it's just there. If that's what you have to do, and here it is. I would rather I would rather if than not have to do this <clears throat> screw through. This, but there's no, I have no choice. So usually they're just on the top four corners, like the piece in, in the gallery right now. So. Um, anyway. So I also, um, as an aside, let me close some of these things. There we go. During uh, COVID, like many artists stuck, not in their studio, well, studios are closed. I started a um, series that um, is actually not on my website. Oh yeah, it is a little bit on my website. Um, it's mostly on my two Instagram accounts, um, Sarah Leahy Studio and COVID Portrait Series. Um, of painting portraits. Come on. Here we go. This is eight by eight inches. They're all eight by eight of people um, who died of COVID. And I've done, she was an incredible Navajo ceramicist. Um, this is a Canadian architect. This one really kills me. She was 14 years old. <laughs> like, uh, and these are on plexiglass as well? 
No, they're all painted. This is, goes back to textiles. It's on this funny paper. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. It's called Waxed Massa, M-A-S-A. It's um, like a really heavy duty wax paper. And I don't know if they make, I bought a box of it from some guy, you know, way back. And he's like, oh, you can have it. No one wants this stuff anymore. Um, I was used to using it from textiles back in the day. This is all pre-Photoshop. It's kind of, it's, I, I, meant, I meant to get a piece of it to show you, but it's, it's, kind of, it's as close as I can get to a paper version of plexiglass. It's translucent. It's kind of hazier though. And it's, it's, um, I just, it's something I like to use because of that. Um, this is with black India ink. Another one. Um, <clears throat> there, so it's just watered down India. Again, I build it up using like in here, just light tone, light tone. And I keep on building up the darker layers and you can't like a watercolor, go back in and take out anything, any mistakes. So it's a real focusing moment. Um, I mean, once in a while you can use white gouache to touch up something, but you really can't. This one was 48 years old, this one. In Jamaica. Jeez. Anyway, um, so I was at home like everyone else and I worked on these at home. Um, they're, they are not sourced from my own photographs. They are sourced from images that the families of these people gave to the New York Times. They were all featured in the Times series, Those We've Lost. Um, not very interesting. For, I mean, you know, they're family photos like at a wedding or, you know, they're not perfectly framed in so I just cropped to the headshot and um, the point of which was, it meant so I'm continuing to do it. I have about 260 of them now, um, of just painting the liveliness in their faces. I mean, look at this woman, <laughs> uh, this man, 100 years old, the last Tuskegee Airman, look at his eyes. It's so he was, I think he was getting the Congressional Medal of Honor from Obama in this picture, but anyway. Uh, means a lot to me. I've been posting them on my my Instagram accounts, and um, and I've been working very hard with a good friend, who's an environmental artist whose studio is next to Edwards, actually, um, and we are trying to develop a proposal for a COVID memorial, a large COVID memorial. So she's making this, working on the structure, we're working on it together, and I've been doing these portraits. I hope to if I have my druthers, but I don't know. I'm not familiar with public art. She that's all she does. So. Um, to do, to render these in architectural glass so they can be outside. Um, anyway, that's one of my other projects. <laughs> so, that's the last, yeah, he was the president of Nava, the Navajo Nation. So, um, like I said, you can look at them on Instagram and they are on my website in one category, COVID portraits, but I don't really know if people know what I'm doing when I say that. Um, so that's it. Can I answer any of the questions? Uh, oh, sorry. <clears throat> I wanted to ask, um, so the way that you explained how you use the plexiglass uh, is you layer it up because you like to have this atmosphere that uh, kind of exists both in front and behind of the subjects that are usually in your pieces. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, that goes hand in hand with your fascination with doing like uh, paintings of water and like of waves with the way the light refraction goes through the waves. And if that's like something that's, you know, I guess you would say like an itch on your brain that is just so fascinating to work with. That's a nice question. Yeah, that's that must be true. And maybe I'm not even aware of it. <laughs> no, I think that's true. Um, yeah, I think that's where I started. Uh, as I said, I really want to have this, sorry, this is a jumble on the screen right now. <laughs> Let me put up one of those pictures. Here. Okay. Well, here's one I didn't get to show. Here. Here's one of light on water. Um, mm. This is really big. Um, for, uh, just as an aside, everything is painted on the surface. There's nothing on the back. Just so you know, people are often don't can't figure. You know, they often think that that it's not somehow partly on the back or the front. Or is it all on the back? Whatever. It's all just built up on the surface, just as a painting, just with my own technique. 
Um, yeah, I think, I mean, for sure, light on water has a great synchronicity with plexiglass and translucency and transparency. Yes, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, and I think you can then apply that to, um, well, the piece that's at the gallery right now. I mean, this is very atmospheric and has a lot of air in it, I would say. Um, so I, I think your question is, is I take your meaning and I agree with you. Yeah, very much. I hope I answered it. <laughs> yeah. I have a question too. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about like your process and how that just takes so much time to do all the detail with the um, sandpaper and the plexiglass. And then also some of your works that show like the, the light and the time throughout the day. How does time factor in, I guess, more broadly to your work? In other words, how I think about it. Is what you're saying. What is this? There we go. Well, well, first, as I said, I, I'm always hoping that I can make a work that's so present that it slows you down enough. And so you acknowledge your presence at that moment. I mean, it's just, it's a very simple thing. Like I feel like it, as in this piece, there's nothing special about any of these moments in the day, if you look at them. I mean, they're just things you can see, somebody reading the paper, you know, it's very um, things that we kind of walk by and don't notice in terms of time. But I think that like this hand reading the newspaper is just beautiful. I mean, not my work, but that, that moment was so beautiful that I wanted to, to paint it um, and see it. And I, so in that sense, it's a sort of a stop time, I guess, um, moment of reflection. That's what I'm hoping to make, um, particularly with this work like this now. I mean, to feel, I hope, you know, you feel that this is large enough that you have this sense of yourself in relation to the image. You know, there isn't any distance in a way between you and the image. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and then of course, with the one that you were speaking of, well, it made me think of this anyway, but yeah. Well, this one, this is kind of more obvious in terms of time. Just because this piece on the left is early in the morning with the sun rising, this is afternoon light in the city, actually from an image I took on top of the Empire State Building. And then this is people walking home in the evening into the light. So in that sense, it's, it's kind of an obvious um, reference to time, but really much more this feeling of the moment is what I, how I would answer that, if that makes sense. Um, I just, yeah. I mean, for me, it's like, as you can see, I'm kind of feeling my way forward. I, I don't have this grand plan of anything or a lot of uh, text about it. I don't know how to put that, um, or politics around it. I just, I really am trying to locate myself in a sense, um, and make some kind of meaning for myself. And I feel like if I do that well enough, I'm doing it for you too. That's it, simple. Um, that's, that's the best I can, that's anything more is just additive. <laughs> that's really it. So, anybody um, else? Yeah. You, sorry. It's okay, I'm just trying to hear. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was wondering if maybe you could talk about like time frame for, for your, specific pieces like um maybe from execution to completion just oh how long it takes yeah yeah oh yeah um <laughs> <laughs> they take a while well here's one i didn't get to show you before once i stopped painting the oceans i had a show in 2009 and it was just like wait i'm done like i'm not gonna do that anymore i was like i don't know how to paint people in space what am i gonna do so i'm like well, I mean, this is a Piero della Francesca. This is after a Piero della Francesca um, fresco, obviously, if you know the work. And I was like, all right, you know, I'm going back to when I was 10 and trying to figure out how to draw a nose. I would copy things because that's the best way to teach yourself how to do stuff is, is to really see it is if you draw it, then you can see it, right? So I did this. This took eight months um, because there's a lot of faces in here. <laughs> In fact, this one is Piero, actually, as a matter of fact, which is interesting. He's the priest in the image. So um, I did this, and that helped me move forward. That was crazy. <laughs> but um, 
mostly something like this was the relief afterwards or like oh gosh I can just paint black well no that didn't work so it took a long time to build up the black I'm like that looks awful um there's a lot of detail in here actually if you start to look at it most of these take about a month or two I'm I'm lucky to be in my studio almost every day um except for COVID <laughs> uh, and I go in you know it's like a nine to five almost um and I you don't work on it all the time because it's too intense and there's a lot of scale of work. You start big and kind of get more refined as I tried to explain before. Uh, but it takes a while, it takes about a month. Say when I was showing regularly, uh, I would do maybe maybe eight, nine, 10 paintings every two years. So that's about it. Um, Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. So, do you work like linearly or do you have like a bunch of projects going on at the same time? Yeah, people ask me that. No, I work one after the other, although I'm thinking about them all and have images, little sketches or, you know, something on my wall that I'm trying to work, put the, I, the whole, all the ideas together. But once I've started the painting, I work almost exclusively on that um, because you get so into it. You know, it's like the only thing I'm knowing I'm trying to, it, it just, I can't not, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, doing the COVID portraits, you know, I can do one a day uh, because you have to, yeah, pretty, oh, sometimes I leave it and finish it the next day, but <clears throat> those are quicker because I use a paintbrush and they're eight by eight. So, but usually the paintings take at least a month or more. <laughs> so let me see, wait a minute. Um, Find one that I just sorry, it's hard. I don't know. Did I pull this one up before? Yes. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, that took a few months. That's really large. That's a beautiful piece. Thank you. <laughs> It's a reflection in a pond, obviously. Um, oh, I did a whole series. Here's another one. Um, the flowers. That took a long time. This is very large, too. So the flowers, you know, it's huge. <laughs> Close up. So I have a question. Um, you're using the word drawing and painting kind of interchangeably. And it seems like in the beginning of the conversation, you were somewhat a little adamant about not using brushes on the plexiglass, which are such a indicative of painting in terms of a tool. Mm -hmm. And so, and then um, the works are in a drawing exhibition. So how do you, how do you find that the work is able to bridge both, both arenas? I have to say, honestly, and I'm sorry, Tammy, if this is, <laughs> I think there, I don't see a distinction. I mean, I can't, you know, I just can't figure out where that line is. Um, you know, there's a, sometimes people say drawing is only on paper or, you know, I don't think that's true, of course. I mean, you can look around and see drawing on ceramics or, I, you know, what, it, or graffiti, I don't know, what do you call, where do you draw, draw the line, so to speak, not to make a pun, but, um, I think the only, I mean, the only way maybe is how evolved, there's sort of a, um, or there used to be sort of a implication that drawing was a, like lesser in some fashion, which I don't think it is. And uh, some some way of, of um, building up to a painting or, I don't think that's true. I just don't know, I don't see a distinction. And I, I, I it's so funny because on my Instagram feed, something came up where Matisse was talking about drawing and painting, there's, you know, they're the same. <laughs> it's art. So um, if you can convey something, I don't, I, I'm sounding really stupid, but that's how I feel. I just, I don't see a distinction. And I, I yeah, brushes, but you can paint with anything, obviously you can draw with anything. Um, it's, that's the best I can do. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's fair. I'm, I'm yeah. just looking for everyone's response and, and 
in a question such as that. And then the other question that um, I've started asking recently, we've identified that you've been in the exhibition twice, but do you know how many times you've applied to the exhibition off the top of your head? Um, not off the top of my head. I could look up on my computer. But no, 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 no. I no. don't know. I honestly don't know. Okay. That's fair. I could, I could, I could look no, 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 no. if you want to hold on. No, no. <laughs> okay. That's fine. <laughs> That's not necessary. No. How long have you guys been doing it? Well, this is our 15th year this year. And, you know, we have every every response, you know, where some people say I've applied for 15 times and have never been able to, mm -hmm. to get in. Um, some people, uh, one of the other artists that we talked to this uh, this year uh, said that this was his first time applying and he got mm -hmm. in. Um, and then, you know, some say, uh, you know, they've applied like maybe eight times and then they get in and, they, you know, it's just, it's nice to hear. And I think it's a, a good example of how these exhibitions um, trying to to get your work noticed by a juror and how difficult that can be and how that's not a, not a final determination of the work per se, but it might be just the limitations of how many pieces can come in versus how many were submitted. And, that, and um, so I think it's, just a nice conversation to to ask folks. Well, I think I think first of all, you guys have a really like a beautiful space, beautiful and obviously really high quality. You know, the whole thing is you don't want. I, I'm honored to be in it. Okay, um, and I think that also in terms of applying, uh, you have to as much as you can. No one's going to come along and pluck you out of nowhere and say we need you. You have to put yourself out there and you never know. I mean, I apply for grants and do all of that all the time. Um, you never know. It's a black box. You don't know if that juror is going to like your work or how, what's going to hit. You just don't know um, who's on the panel for whatever. And um, if they've seen your work, I mean, that's the other thing, you know, looking at my work online is entirely different than experiencing it. And, you know, it's, it's hard. It's very, it's a, um, Part of the project of being an artist is doing that, is applying for things and trying to be seen. Um, that's it. But thank you for having me because I, I really, it looks beautiful, the new museum, first of all, the renovated space. And I'm, I appreciate being in the exhibition enormously. So, absolutely. Well, work looks great it. too. So, I also think, I mean, I, what I was able to see, I was planning on coming down until I got COVID. Um, but the other work, it's such a diverse show. It looks really great to have this, all this different work together. Yeah, agree, agree. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, this has been wonderful. And um, I think I can speak on behalf of the students that um, it's just been a real pleasure talking to you and getting to see more of your work. And um, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I, uh, I was very flattered that you asked me, this is my studio entrance. So what I would say to you guys is if anybody's here in New York, please come and visit. I really mean it. I have people coming in all the time. The building is wonderful. I could show you a few of my friends' studios. I mean, it's, it's an amazing place with a whole, whole variety of different work from all over the world. And it's a, it's an interesting place, but I'd love to have you come visit if you want to. So knock on my door, send me an email. I'm always there. <laughs> well, that's going to go on.